Thank you so much, Neil, for the introduction, and thank you to everyone for being here. Thank you also to Rachel for being such a wonderful host to me. I've had a great time here at CSM today, and I've met um, so many wonderful people, great students, really invested teachers. I really appreciate y'all for involving me in what y'all are doing here. Um, I'm a little nervous. My friend uh, Alan King, the great poet, is here, so. I always feel uh, a little nervous when I have to read in front of Alan, so y'all gonna have to forgive me for shaking. Um, I'll just read you some poems, is that okay? Where I'm from, I'm from a very particular family. They, um, they play cards every Friday night, and they fought every Saturday. But we went to church every Sunday morning and um, there was reason, because of rehearsals and other meetings, that we ended up going to church every day up until Friday came again. Um, so where I'm from, no matter what we were starting, we always begin with prayer. So prayer of the backhanded. Not the palm, not the pear tree switch, not the broomstick nor the closest extension cord, not his braided belt, but God bless the back of my daddy's hand, which holding nothing tightly against me and not wrapped in leather, eliminated the air between itself and my cheek. Make full this dimpled cheek unworthy of its unfisted print and forgive my forgetting the love of a hand hungry for reflex, a hand that took no thought of its target, like hail from a blind sky, involuntary, fast, but brutal in its bruising. Father, I bear the bridge of what might have been a broken nose. I lift to you what was a busted lip. Bless the boy who believes his best beatings lack intention, the mark of the beast. Bring back to life the son who glories in the sin of immediacy, calling it love. God, save the man whose arm, like an angel's invisible wing, may fly backward in fury whether or not his son stands near. Help me hold in place my blazing jaw as I think to say, excuse me. Labor. I spent what light Saturday sent sweating and learned to cuss cutting grass for women kind enough to say they couldn't tell the damn difference between their mowed lawns and their vacuumed carpets just before handing over a $5 bill rolled tighter than a joint and asking me in to change a few light bulbs. I called those women old because they wouldn't move out of a chair without my help or walk without a hand at the base of their backs. I called them old and they must have been they're all dead now, dead and in the earth I once tended. The loneliest people have the earth to love and not one friend their own age, only mothers to baby them and big sisters to boss them around. Women, you want to please and pray for the chance to say please to. I don't do that kind of work anymore. My job is to look at the childhood I hated and say, I once had something to do with my hands. Um, I'm originally from Louisiana, which is a place with its own English language. Uh, there are words and phrases that I'm always trying to revive and recover that I remember from when I was a kid there. Uh, this poem is titled after one of those phrases. Uh, if you don't know this phrase, I think the poem itself will make will make its meaning clear to you. 40 in the morning. My mother grew morning glories that spilled onto the walkway toward her porch. 
because she was a woman with a land who showed as much by giving it color. She told me I could have whatever I worked for. That means she was an American. But she'd say it was because she believed in God. I am ashamed of America and confounded by God. I thank God for my citizenship in spite of the timer set on my life to write these words. I love my mother. I love black women who plant flowers as sheepish as their sons. By the time the blooms unfurl themselves for a few hours of light, the women who tend them are already at work. Blue, I'll never know who started the lie that we are lazy, but I'd love to wake that bastard up at 40 in the morning, toss him in a truck, and drive him under God past every bus stop in America to see all those black folk waiting to go work for whatever they want. A house, a boy to keep the lawn cut, some color in the yard, my God, we leave things green. Speaking of that place where I grew up, uh, more specifically in the community, in the neighborhood where I, where I grew up, um, is where I first fell in love with language because you could hear that there were specific intonations, uh, specific uses of vernacular that would just blow your mind the way people would bring up and make use of language when I was a kid. I was always excited about the way things said, people said things much more than I was by what they said. So this next poem is a poem that is entirely made up of sentences that I heard as a kid. So all of these sentences, they're, they're literally sentences I heard other people say and I stole them for my poem. So, <laughs> So here, um, here's that poem, and I have a feeling that some of you in this room have heard some of these same sentences. So this is, a, this is a community poem. Autobiography. Keep the line steady. Keep your back straight. Keep coming back for more. Keep fucking with me, Cletus. Keep putting your hands on me like that and you'll always have a place to lay your head. Keep my waistline down, keep your figure up, keep your man happy, keep a woman crazy, keep your daddy off your mama or next time I'm calling the police. Keep these nappy headed children off my green, green grass. Keep talking smart if you want to. Keep looking at my man and I'll cut you a new eyelid. Keep looking me in my face when you tell your next lie. Keep on walking, I ain't talking to you anymore. Keep holding that last note. Keep singing while I get the splinter out. Keep singing for Jesus, baby, and everything will be all right. Keep me in your prayers. Keep us in your thoughts. Keep your eyes on the black one. He ain't got no sense. Keep your money in your pocket, Nelson. These hoes giving it away. Keep this one occupied. I'll get his wallet. Keep on living, honey, and you'll get old too. Uh, the only thing you may want to know before I read this next poem is that uh, the radio staple Memory Lane was released posthumously by Capitol Records from the 1979 album Mini. It's uh, Minnie Ripperton's last album. She's a singer I love so much. Um, Minnie Ripperton's most popular for that ability to hit those really high whistle register notes, um, the, kind of, um, the kind of sound that you either love or that makes you want to turn the stereo down. She's probably one of the biggest influences for people like Mariah Carey. Um, and she, uh, the song that all of you, well, maybe not, times have changed. There's a song that's very popular by Minnie Ripperton. It's called Loving You. Some of you may know the chorus to this song. is. Uh, La 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 la, la 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 la, la 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 la, dooby dooby doo doo. Hey, somebody tried it out. I like that. Um, so this is not about that song. Uh, <laughs> this is about a different song. Track three, back down, memory lane. Dangerous men park carefully slanting oversized automobiles into the ditches that line 77th. It's Friday night in Shreveport. Checks have been cashed, bills folded and stashed 
into wallets and bra straps, card tables, folding chairs, and every gold tooth in town crowd our grandmother's camelback shotgun house because gambling's illegal in Shreveport and she cuts only $2 a hand for every joker that slides into a queen. We don't know many Ripperton's dead years now, buried with one breast to her name. School uniformed in a corner, we learn to listen to music over hollers through smoke. Her soprano comes across a photograph in giggles, but ends up crying, save me. We think we'd like that kind of love, sad and steeped in trumpets, though a block up, the entire decade shoots for words to put in the dictionary. Crackhead, drive by, loss and gain. The bullet meant for a man named Money removes his baby sister's chin. Ask for horns in Shreveport and sirens are on the way. We can't hear either grandmama calling for us to change the tape. No more slow songs. Keep us awake these years before surgeons slice her in vain and we drive away our car stereos playing rhythm and blues. Poets can't get enough of Greek myth. Um, so this next poem has a little bit of the Odyssey in it. Uh, it occurs to me now that there's something of um, World War I and World War II in this poem as well. Hero. She never knew one of us from another. So my brothers and I grew up fighting over our mother's mind. Like sun-colored suitors in a Greek myth, we were willing to do evil. We kept chocolate around our mouths. The last of her mother's lot she cried at funerals, cried when she whipped me. She whipped me daily. I am most interested in people who declare gratitude for their childhood beatings. None of them took what my mother gave, waking us for school with sharp slaps to our bare thighs. That side of the family is darker. I should be grateful, so I will be. No one on earth knows how many abortions happened before a woman risked her freedom by giving that risk a name, by taking it to breast. I don't know why I am alive now that I still cannot impress the woman who whipped me into being. I turned my mother into a grandmother. She thanks me by kissing my sons. Gratitude is black black as a hero returning from war to a country that banked on his death. Thank God, it can't get much darker than that. As a human being, there is the happiness you have and the happiness you deserve. They sit apart from each other the way you and your mother sat on opposite ends of the sofa after an ambulance came to take your father away. Some good doctor will stitch him up and soon an aunt will arrive to drive your mother to the hospital where she will settle next to him forever as promised. She holds the arm of her seat as if she could fall, as if it is the only sturdy thing. And it is, since you've done what you always wanted. You fought your father and won, marred him. He'll have a scar he can see all because of you. And your mother, the only woman you ever cried for, must tend to it as a bride tends to her vows, forsaking all others, no matter how sore the injury. No matter how sore the injury has left you, you sit understanding yourself as a human being, finally free now that nobody's got to love you.
a young man. We stand together on our block, me and my son, neighbors saying our face is the same, but I know he's better than me. When other children move toward my daughter, he lurches like a brother meant to put them down. He is a bodyguard on the playground. He won't turn apart from her, empties any enemy, leaves them flimsy, me confounded. I never fought for so much. I calmed my daughter when I could cradle my daughter. My son swaggers about her. He won't have to heal a girl he won't let free. They are so small and I still am a young man. In him lives my black anger made red. They play. He is not yet incarcerated. Uh, this next poem is titled after one of those words that I grew up hearing. Um, I should probably tell y'all, I'm originally from Shreveport, Louisiana, which is Northwest Louisiana. Um, I grew up there and then I left there and I lived uh, for almost 10 years in New Orleans, Louisiana. I left there and I lived for almost for five years in Houston, Texas. So I, I, I've spent most of my life in this very tight Southern radius. Um, and then I moved to San Diego, California, which is where I found out that I have an accent. Um, <laughs> And the other thing I found out was that there were all these words and phrases that I, I figured you could look up in the dictionary, but you couldn't, they weren't there. Um, and this poem is titled after one of those words. Uh, the word is uh, maybe, we're, not, we're, we're in the South. I'll give y'all this. Y'all might know this word. The word is nim. Sometimes I'm reading and I look up and I realize people actually know this word. The word is nim and it means that person and everyone you associate with that person. To put it in context for you, if you knew someone in high school and you hadn't seen them in a long time, but when you knew them, you knew them, you knew their family, you hung out with them a lot. If you saw them again, you might say to them, hey, how you doing? How's your mama, nim? <laughs> and nim. They said to say goodnight and not goodbye. Unplugged the TV when it rained. They hid money in mattresses so to sleep on decisions. Some of their children were not their children. Some of their parents had no birth dates. They could sweat a cold out of you. They'd wake without an alarm telling them to. Even the short ones reached certain shells. Even the skinny cooked animals too quick to catch. And I don't care how ugly one of them arrived. That one got married to somebody fine. They fed families with change and wiped their kitchens clean. Then another century came. People like me forgot their names. I wrote this next poem after finding out about and being confounded by the very long list of people who have supposedly committed suicide while in, while in police custody. Um, that list includes people like Jesus Huerta in North Carolina who after having been patted down while handcuffed on the walk from the police cruiser to the building where he was to be booked, somehow managed to shoot himself in the back corner of his head. Um, Victor White III in Louisiana, where I'm from, who after having been patted down while handcuffed, sitting in the back seat of a police cruiser, somehow managed to shoot himself in the upper back. Victor White III, um, and then there's Sandra Bland in Texas, who after a day of fighting for her life, hang herself with a trash bag in a cell where there's video footage um, that has technical difficulty. Um, that video footage goes out at the same moment that the coroner says she must have hung herself with a trash bag. Bullet points. 
I will not shoot myself in the head. And I will not shoot myself in the back. And I will not hang myself with a trash bag. And if I do, I promise you, I will not do it in a police car while handcuffed or in the jail cell of a town I only know the name of because I have to drive through it to get home. Yes, I may be at risk, but I promise you, I trust the maggots who live beneath the floorboards of my house to do what they must to any carcass more than I trust an officer of the law of the land to shut my eyes like a man of God might or to cover me with a sheet so clean my mother could have used it to tuck me in when I kill me. I will do it the same way most Americans do. I promise you cigarette smoke or a piece of meat on which I choke or so broke I freeze in one of these winters we keep calling worst. I promise if you hear of me dead anywhere near a cop, then that cop killed me. He took me from us and left my body, which is no matter what we've been taught greater than the settlement a city can pay a mother to stop crying and more beautiful than the new bullet fished from the folds of my brain. So it's really interesting um, surviving the 20th century and living in the 21st century. Um, you see the whole world turned upside down sometimes for the better, sometimes in ways that seem wholly dastardly to me. Um, when I was a kid, it was not cool to be a nerd. And now people wear t-shirts that say nerd. And you can have the kind of nerd you are on the t-shirt. People will stop and they'll read your t-shirt and they'll be so excited that you're a nerd. But I grew up a real life nerd. And you know, one of the things that I've learned as an adult is that you can't go around thinking you had it worse than everybody else. Um, whatever situation you were in, somebody had it worse than you. But I really did have it worse than everybody else. <laughs> and I can prove, I can actually prove that I had it worse. If you, if you are a comic book nerd, then you have a place to go. And there will be people there when you get there who are also comic book nerds. Or if you're a video game nerd, um, if you actually own something that you can play video games are on, everybody loves you, everybody wants to be friends with you, you know you always have somebody to play video games with. Well, I had it worse than I know I did because I was a riddle nerd. Um, I knew like riddles from highlights by heart. I was like a seven-year-old knocking on people's thighs, asking them a bunch of questions, trying to get the answer, you know? Um, it was real, it was really awful. Nobody wanted to see me coming. So it's true, it's true. So when I became a poet, I wanted to sort of commemorate my former nerd, my former nerdship um, and, and match it to my new nerdship as a poet. And I, I decided I was going to write a poem that was also a riddle, but I kept failing. And the reason I kept failing is because in order to write a riddle, you always know where you're going. You ask all those questions backing into your own answer. Um, but to write a poem, you can't know where you're going. You have to make discoveries. You don't know where language is going to lead you. And that is the joy of writing poems. Um, so I wrote this poem and it's a riddle. Uh, and I think maybe it works. And if it does, it's only because I don't know the answer to the riddle. Uh, but you know, y'all can email me later and maybe tell me if y'all figure it out. <laughs> I really don't know. Uh. Riddle. We do not recognize the body of Emmett Till. We do not know the boy's name nor the sound of his mother wailing. We have never heard a mother wailing. We do not know the history of this nation in ourselves. We do not know the history of ourselves on this planet because we do not have to know what we believe we own. We believe we own your bodies, but have no use for your tears. We destroy the body that refuses use. We use maps we did not draw. We see a sea, so cross it. 
we see a moon, so land there. We love land so long as we can take it. Shh, we can't take that sound. What is a mother wailing? We do not recognize music until we can sell it. We sell what cannot be bought. We buy silence. Let us help you. How much does it cost to hold your breath underwater? Wait, wait. What are we? What? What on earth are we? What? Uh, this next poem makes use of the myth of Ganymede. If you don't know that myth, then it'll, I think, become clear in the poem. Ganymede. A man trades his son for horses. That's the version I prefer. I like the safety of it. No one at fault. Everyone rewarded. God gets the boy. The boy becomes immortal. His father rides until grief sounds as good as the gallop of an animal born to carry those who patrol our inherited kingdom. When we look at myth this way, nobody bothers saying, rape. I mean, don't you want God to want you? Don't you dream of someone with wings taking you up? And when the master comes for our children, he smells like the men who own stables in heaven, that far terrain between promise and apology. No one has to convince us. The people of my country believe we can't be hurt if we can be bought. I'm going to shift gears here and... Um, hopefully maybe shift mood a little bit. Um, I was so happy to have uh, dinner with, with Michael and Kathleen tonight, and they gave me all the best uh, Lucille Clifton stories ever. And then um, in the introduction, Neil mentioned Clifton, and he also um, mentioned the word cruelty. And I thought it would be um, um, apropos for me to recite this poem by Lucille Clifton. So do y'all mind if I just take a quick break? Y'all still give me my check if I say somebody else's <laughs> poem, right? So I'm gonna... Um, I think I, know, I think I know this poem by Clifton. Um, it's not as well known a poem. You know, usually when people are reciting Clifton, um, there's sort of a, a, a recitation storehouse of Lucille Clifton poems. Um, and Won't You Come Celebrate With Me is like number one on that, on that list. But so it's not that poem. I'm sorry. Um, but it's, it's a poem I really do love and maybe a little, a, a little less known. Let's see. Cruelty. Don't talk to me about cruelty or what I am capable of. When I wanted the roaches dead, I wanted them dead and I killed them. I took a broom to their country and smashed and sliced without warning, without stopping, and I smiled all the time I was doing it. It was a holocaust of roaches, bodies, parts of bodies, red all over the ground, I didn't ask their names. They had no names worth knowing. Now I watch myself whenever I enter a room. I never know what I might do. Uh, isn't that great? That's Lucille Clifton. That's pretty great. It's pretty great. It's pretty great. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of Lucille Clifton. Another elegy. I want to relax, but it's April. My students cross and uncross bare legs, one thigh in turn holding the other down, each limb, every stem on earth at battle, studded with buds all cocked to win as the world splits into its stains. I live with the disease instead of a lover. We take turns doing bad things to my body, share a house, but do not speak. We eat what I feed. Spring is a leg and can't be covered. One day I was born. That was long ago. Um, 
I'm reading to you retrospectively, which is to say I'm reading to you from my first book, Please, um, from my, sec my second book, The New Testament. My mother's still angry with me about that title. And uh, from my third book, my brand new baby book, The Tradition. She's seven months old. <laughs> it's true. I'm very proud of her. She's so pretty. She, um, this is what I really love about her. I love telling, I tell people this everywhere I go because it's true. I will not lie to you. You do not have to like these poems to buy this book. <laughs> and, and I feel like that's a complete sentence, but I'll give you a reason, because sometimes people like reasons. The reason why is because this is the best cover on any book of poetry ever. Isn't this a gorgeous image? I think it's really well done. So it's perfect for your coffee table. <laughs> You can sit it right there on your coffee table and people will look at it and don't worry, they won't open the book. Uh, uh, and if you don't have a coffee table, here's your reason to finally get one. So um, one of the features of this book is a form that I invented called the duplex. The duplex, the duplex is at once a puzzle, a sonnet, and a blues poem. And I'm going to read one for you now and I think you'll hear the elements of those forms come through in my reading of this next poem. Duplex. I begin with love, hoping to end there. I don't want to leave a messy corpse. I don't want to leave a messy corpse full of medicines that turn in the sun. Some of my medicines turn in the sun. Some of us don't need hell to be good. Those who need most need hell to be good. What are the symptoms of your sickness? Here is one symptom of my sickness. Men who love me are men who miss me. Men who leave me are men who miss me in the dream where I am an island. In the dream where I am an island, I grow green with hope. I'd like to end there. I'm going to finish um, with a few love poems. Can I read you some love poems? Are y'all okay with that? It's, it's nice to, um, y'all are good with that? It's okay? Uh, it's nice to ask for consent. Um, I, <laughs> I, um, I, you know, uh, I've had the opportunity to travel around a lot with this book and, and to travel abroad. Um, I've been to Spain, to Germany, to the uh, United Kingdom, and to Singapore. and. Uh, it's interesting when you're in these contexts abroad and you see people who are together, there's no doubt that they're together because doing the same things that they are doing abroad, uh, if they were in the American context, we would tell them to get a room, you know? Um, so it's always nice when I can come to readings like this and I see people sitting together. And you know, in the American context, you're like, you're not really sure what's going on. You know, is y'all brother and sister or what, you know? So I'm gonna read you some love poems because you never know what might help. <laughs> Tonight could be finally. Um, uh, for this next poem, you may want to know that Billy Strayhorn wrote Lush Life when he was still a teenager. Uh, Lush Life is one of my favorite songs ever, period. If you don't know it, go listen to it. My, my favorite version of it is actually, interestingly, enough, I think it's strange, but my favorite version of it is by Natalie Cole. Obviously, Nat King Cole has a great version of Lush Life. Um, even Queen Latifah has, has a version of it um, that you can hear. Uh, it's, it's a really, really interesting song, very complex, um, very difficult to sing. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of bands don't like to play the song because it's so much trouble to play. But the result, if you get it right, is a beautiful result. You know, every time I think about that, every time I think about Billy Strayhorn, writing a song that beautiful and that strange and complex. Every time I think about him writing Lush Life when he was still just a teenager, I really hate Billy Strayhorn. <laughs> Track one, Lush Life. The woman with the microphone sings to hurt you, to see you shake your head. The mic may as well be a leather belt. You drive to the center of town to be whipped by a woman's voice. You can't tell the difference between a leather belt and a lover's tongue. A lover's tongue 
might call you bitch, a term of endearment where you come from, a kind of compliment preceded by the word sing in certain nightclubs, a lush little tongue you have. You can yell, sing bitch, and I love you with a shot of Patron at the end of each phrase from the same bar stool every Saturday night. But you can't remember your father's leather belt without shaking your head. That's what satisfies her, the woman with the microphone. She does not mean to entertain you, and neither do I. Speak to me in a lover's tongue. Call me your bitch, and I'll sing the whole night long. Y'all said I could read love poems. <laughs> you, you asked for it. Coliseum. I don't remember how I hurt myself, the pain mine long enough for me to lose the wound that invented it, as none of us knows the beauty of our own eyes until a man tells us they are why God made brown. Then that same man says he lives to touch the smoothest parts, suggesting our surface area can be understood by degrees of satin. Him I will follow until I am as rough outside as I am within. I cannot locate the origin of slaughter, but I know how my own feels, that I live with it and sometimes use it to get the living done because I am what gladiators call a man in love, love being any reminder that we survive. Um, I love, I hope it's clear to y'all, I love poetry. I love poetry more than anything in the world. Well, except one thing. Um, the only thing I love, uh, the only thing I love more than poetry is cuddling. Um, so, you know, poets are supposed to be really humble and modest, and I'm not, because I'm, <laughs> I'm really proud of this next poem, because it's about cuddling. So I get to bring my two favorite things into the same place at the same time. I think Rachel likes this poem. Stand. Peace on this planet, our guns glowing hot. We lay there together as if we were getting something done. It felt like planting a garden or planning a meal for a people who still need feeding. All that touching, or barely touching, not saying much, not adding anything. The cushion of it, the skin, and occasional sigh, all seemed like work worth mastering. I'm sure somebody died while we made love. Somebody killed somebody black. I thought then of holding you as a political act. I may as well have held myself. We didn't stand for one thought, didn't do a damn thing. And though you left me, I'm glad we didn't. I'll end with a, um, I'll end with a, another duplex. I'll end with actually the last duplex in the book, which is also the last poem in the book. Uh, as I mentioned to you, a duplex is uh, all at once, a huzzle, a sonnet, and a blues poem. There's an added later of form on this, uh, on this last poem that I'm going to read for you because it's also a cento. A cento is a poem that is completely made up of lines from other people's poems. Um, this cento is a little bit different because it is completely made up of lines from all of the other duplexes in the book. So this is a cento that uses, you might hear an echo of something you heard before because it's using all the other poems and sort of putting them together into one poem. Um, this is, um, by the way, this is proof that poetry is the superior genre. 
because prose writers can't read the last page of their book to you. <laughs> Fiction writers won't read you the last page of their novel, honey. Okay. Uh, huh, huh, huh. So, huh. so, uh, huh. so I'm gonna. Um, so I'll finish. I'll finish. I'll finish with this poem. Duplex, Cento. My last love drove a burgundy car, color of a rash, a symptom of sickness. We were the symptoms, the road, our sickness. None of our fights ended where they began. None of the beaten end where they begin. Any man in love can cause a messy corpse, but I didn't want to leave a messy corpse obliterated in some lilied field, a stench obliterating lilies of the field, the murderer young and unreasonable. He was so young, so unreasonable, steadfast and awful, tall as my father, steadfast and awful. My tall father was my first love. He drove a burgundy car. Thank you all so much. <laughs> you know, it's a funny question you asked me that. I've never I mean, there is something I do, but I've never thought I would have to tell anybody. Um, I usually find like a second to sit, and I say holy over and over again. I used to do it in a mirror. I would go to a bathroom, but I don't have to do it in a mirror anymore. Um, I always want to throw up before I read. So I used to throw up every night. When Please came out and I had to read, I was throwing up every, it was crazy, because then I would be like trying, I would always have to have mints, like I would throw up, I would go sit down, I would give the reading, then I would be like, oh my God, my mouth tastes like vomit. <laughs> and then I would have to like hurry up and like pop a bunch of candy in my mouth because I had to go sign books, you know, it was people, it was crazy. And then by the time the New Testament came out, I wasn't having that same problem, but I was still queasy every time. And so it's a lot easier for me now, but I'm still nervous, but I usually just sit and I go, this is so weird, I can't stand you. I say, um, holy, 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 holy. That's literally the rhythm and the melody. Holy, 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 holy. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like, I mean, I don't know. I want to say that it's like chanting, but I don't, you know. I'm not saying yum num yo ho renge kyo, so I don't I don't want to be appropriative in any way. But it is like that for me, I think, that it sort of just it helps me recenter myself. When I'm whenever I'm giving a reading, it's really important to me that I forget people are there. So if I can put myself in the same mindset that I was in when I write was writing the poems, then I'll be okay. Cause you know when you write in your poems, every you like, yeah, man, I wrote that line. You know, you write a metaphor that's hot, and you like, slap. You know what I mean? You be at the committee. Come on, seriously, y'all right, so y'all know. You know, when, you, when, you, when you're working and stuff is going together, you like, so what I do is I just try to remember. I mean, if I can imagine it, sort of like, you know, when I'm writing my poems, it's 1 o'clock in the morning, and I'm pacing my house, and I look like a crazy person chanting to himself, and I'm like, and then I'm running back to the computer because I got something I got to type it down. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that's pretty much what I'm trying to do. If I can like forget that y'all are here, then I can get through reading a poem because all I have to do is remember what that was like. And when, when I was in that mode, I was like, do you know what I mean? Like I knew I could do anything. I felt like I could fly, right? But then, you know, waking up and going outside to go to work the next morning, you don't feel the same way. So yeah, does that answer you? Thank you so much for your question. <laughs>
I think it's really hard to translate um, being in search of, I mean, it's the poet's state of being to be in search of vulnerability and intimacy through language. And that's very difficult to translate in a culture that tells us to be armored at all times. You know, um, I live in Georgia where it is very important to people that they walk around with guns. You, they want you to not only, you, it's not just that they have a gun, they want you to know I have a gun. So there is no way, like they want you, they want you to understand that they are impervious. And so like you go in a grocery store and people are walking around with their gun, you know what I mean? Um, so poets sort of want the op opposite of that, at least in their own rooms, at least in their own offices. They wanna be in a position where memories, where language, where images that invariably will hurt them or lead them to a state of love. Y'all do understand that the state of love is a state of vulnerability. Um, if you don't, think about your mama and your daddy and then you'll get it real quick. So if think about your kids and you'll get it real quick. But so the state of love is a state of vulnerability and poets are trying to like reenact that state over and over again while they're, while they're writing. So there's a way that, yes, of course, at first when you, began do, when you begin to do that, um, you're very scared. Um, but you also understand that if you're a poet, you've, been re you've probably been reading poems that do just that, and they've been saving your life, right? Um, you know, we talked a lot about Clifton tonight. That poem, I love that poem so much because I feel like there's some humor in it, and then there's this truth about our own evil and what we're willing to do. Do you understand? And that, that changed me reading that poem. That changed the way I saw things and what I, I, I myself thought of myself as capable of. Do you see what I mean? So when I see that and I know that's what a poem can do, then I want to do it. I don't want to do anything less than that. So I want to put myself on the line every time I go work with my poems. So what the question then is what's at risk? And the, and, and the, the, the real question is not just what's at risk, it's what's at risk when you tell the truth. Because vulnerability is really just about, oh, this is the actual me. So, so the real problem is we're under the impression that you should show up as something at, other than the actual you. This, we got that from, you know, this is why people create whole other selves. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? Like, you all following me? And this is why you end up sleeping with people who really ain't said nothing to you but sup and W-I-D. You know what I mean? Because like, oh, I have no clue who or what you are, so therefore, let's lay down. Do you know, <laughs> do you know what I mean? So, because it's easier. You don't have to deal when it's that way. So, um, so I'm sort of the opposite. I'm interested in getting into a space through language where I'm facing myself over and over again and where when I get up to read my poems or when someone reads my poems, they have to face the fact of the truth because that's what I get from poetry, I get the truth. And I have to take the risk that telling the truth will do whatever telling the truth will do. But I've been willing to take that risk because poetry has afforded me my entire life. Uh, little, I didn't know that when I started, that was a leap, that was a bigger risk in the beginning than it is now, but it was one I was willing to take. So that's, does that answer you? I don't know if I have the answer because I don't read my poems as a reader would. Do you understand what I mean? Um, it's very hard when you're a poet to separate yourself from the technical aspects of what you've made. So, so what I mean by this is the person who built the car you drive does not feel about your car. They literally made your car and do not feel about your car the way you feel about your car. So if you have a memory of it, do you understand what I'm saying? Everybody, let me give you an example. I love this, this is my favorite example in the world because it's really cool. Watch this, I'm so excited. <laughs> this, is what, this is the kind of stuff I do when I'm teaching. I feel like I'm a genius. Anyway, <laughs> y'all keep, yeah, let me stop, okay. So listen, everybody in this room has a tree. Think of your tree. Isn't that something? Isn't that amazing? So you have some emotional response to something from the natural realm, right? Generally, maybe you kissed under it, maybe you used to climb it, whatever it was. You have, maybe you got beat with branches from it, I don't know. But you have a relationship to a tree. 
Do y'all follow what I mean? So the person who planted that tree cannot account for the emotions that you associate with that tree. That person was planting trees. Do, do you follow? This is also the reason why I know poets are not narcissists. People kill me acting like poets have done something wrong in this world. And poets kill me being ashamed of themselves. Y'all, we have to stop being ashamed of ourselves. If you are not a narcissist when you plant a tree, how are, what does a tree do? Don't tell me it gives us oxygen, because when you thought about your tree, you were not thinking about breathing. <laughs> do y'all understand what I'm saying? What, that's what a poem does. That's beauty. That's connection. Do y'all understand what I mean? Y'all will literally take a drive. Somebody said this. I came here today on the train, and um, I told the person who was driving, he's like, where are you headed? And I said, where I was headed. And he said, oh, that's a great train ride. I was like, it's a great train ride? It's a train ride. He's like, yeah, it's really cool, because you know the route they take, you see such interesting things, and you'll be in people's backyards at certain points. And I was like, oh, he just is interested in beauty. Do you see what I mean? So when I, the best I can tell you to answer this question is when I think of redemption, I don't think of redemption, I do think of tenderness, but only because um, if I am a poet of witness, that means I have to really see the world. And my world is not, you know, I'm not, as um, Zora Neale Hurston used to say, I am not tragically black. Um, my world is not evil, though there is evil among us. Right? There is plenty of joy in my world. And I want to reflect both of those things in my poems because I want to be honest about all aspects of life. Right? But if there is redemption, then hopefully the redemption is in the fact that one can recognize him or herself in the work, that one can be indicted or one can be affirmed in the work. Right? That when you read it, you are not only affirmed because of self-recognition, but also because of having a response to beauty. You know, it's not just that something is beautiful and we feel good. We also feel good that we recognized its beauty. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? Like we literally have two things that happen to us at once through our relationship to a tree. It's not just like, oh, I love this tree. It's like, oh, I love this tree. <laughs> and I think that is very human and special. And that's something for us to honor. And that reaction is what allows us to change over time, to transform, to mature as adults. You know, that was James Baldwin's problem. He, he just thought we wanted to be babies all the time. He got on his nerves. Like, anyway, he got on his nerves. So I'll stop. Does that answer you? Yeah. Yeah, people see things, uh, they're, they're clearly right because it's in the work. And people see things that are, people have seen things that are quite, obviously subconscious, that even after I was done with the poem, I never saw. I just knew the poem was working, but I didn't subconsciously know. I have a cousin who um, gets really frustrated with me um, and doesn't imagine that she could be frustrating. I have a, people ask me very often at Q&As how my family feels about my poems, and um, my answer is that they just love my work. They're so supportive, um, and I'll tell you how. They're so supportive because my, remember, there are cousins, aunts, uncles, they have all of my books, and they put their books on that proverbial coffee table. When people come over, they say, hey, look, there's Trey, my family, they call me Trey. There's Trey's book, you know? And people are impressed, like, oh, your cousin got a book, you know? And um, part of the reason why they can be supportive like that is because none of them have ever actually opened any of those books. Um, <laughs> They haven't read my books, and so, and I don't want them to. They're welcome to keep not reading them as long as they keep buying them, honey. So, um, so my, I'm, I'm, I'm telling this story to say I have a cousin who had, have one cousin who has read all of my poems, all of my books, and every time a, she's older than me, and every time a book comes out, she'll buy the book, and soon, and I know, and sooner or later she'll call me on the phone, and she'll say, Trey, I read your book. It's really something else. Now, I was just wondering about this one poem. <laughs> and I was hoping that you could just explain this one part of this one poem to me. And I say, oh, sure. And she reads me the poem. And then she says the thing she doesn't understand. And I try to explain it to her. And she says, oh, OK, so that's what you meant. Oh, all right. Well, you know, there's this other poem. And before it's over, we've done that. We've done this three books in a row now. 
every book before it's over, I've like explained every poem. She gets really frustrated with me because she comes to questions that I don't know the answer to. She's like, you don't know the answer? Oh, well, no wonder you ain't doing too good. You know? <laughs> she's, also, she's also very frustrated that I only rhyme sometimes. I have formal poems in all of my books, but um, she gets really frustrated that I only rhyme sometimes. She's like, well, you know, if she'll come to a poem that rhymes, she'll say, now, Trey, this one rhymes. <laughs> You might try to do more like this one. I really see, I see this one, I can hear it. It rhymes. You know? so, um, so yeah, her interpretations of the poems are always very different from mine because every time we're doing this, she's trying to figure out which poem is about her. And I'm like, how did you think these poems are about you? Where did you get this? You know? Well, I put a poem in the last book, it's called Dark, and um, it rhymes in a real harsh and almost dog doggerel kind of a way. And I was thinking about her when I wrote the poem. And she caught it. She called me. She's like, I know you wrote this one for me. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, I'm sorry I took so long to answer your question. But that's the, that's the answer to the question. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank no? you. Thank you all so much.